ton of voter registration drives around campus. Um, and if you guys are interested in hosting one of those voter registration drives, or if you need to get registered to vote, um, you can talk with me uh, tonight and I can help you out um, with that. So at the CSLC, this Community Service Learning Center that we have on campus, we do a lot of work um, with both democratic engagement and community engagement. So how many of you guys have heard of the CSLC? Sweet, thank you. <laughs> um, so our mission at the CSLC is to connect students with opportunities on campus, around our Allendale and Grand Rapids community, and around the globe. Um, to promote active global citizenship um, and get you guys um, to be more engaged in your communities. Um, so uh, with that, like I said, we do all of these democratic engagement events. We also do um, community engagement uh, events such as our MLK Day of Service and Solidarity that we hosted last weekend. Uh, in the fall, uh, we did our beach cleanup, our uh, Make a Difference Day. Um, we have ongoing days of community action that are open to um, all students, but Lib uh, 100 and 201 students as well. Um, how many of you guys are here for that tonight? Sweet, so we also have our, um, our peer mentors here. Uh, if you guys can raise your hands where our peer mentor is at. Great. Okay, cool. Um, so they are here to answer any questions that you guys might have in regards to your classwork um, and are very helpful and awesome individuals. So um, make sure to go up to them if you guys have any questions. So a little bit more about um, our work at the CSLC. Um, as I said, I am a civic engagement associate. Um, and if you guys are interested in doing any of this work, we have positions that we are hiring for for next fall. Um, so you guys can um, could be hired to be a civic engagement associate like I am, um, or a democracy fellow with a few national nonprofits that help us specifically um, around voter engagement, um, working with our Campus Democratic Engagement Coalition, which is a group of students, staff, faculty, community partners um, that really are the boots on the ground um, who help us do all of um, our work um, during our election seasons. Um, and we also, are there any grad students in here tonight by chance? No? Well, we also have a grad assistant uh, position open. If anybody knows anybody that would be interested in that. Um, so tonight, you guys are all here for Democracy 101. Thank you for attending. Um, and our series this semester is focused around this idea of the American dream. Uh, and tonight, we are going to be talking about the history of the American dream um, and this concept um, that we know is not achievable for all Americans. And um, our host this evening, uh, Steve Tripp, is going to be talking uh, with us um, all about that. So we're very excited to have you all here for that. Before we get started tonight, um, you'll find a few uh, documents on your table that I just want to go over really quickly with you all. Um, so this first one, there is a um, guide for productive dialogue on your table. Does everyone see that? on there? Yes, nods, okay, maybe. Um, so these are really helpful in just um, understanding that if you're in a discussion at your table or you hear something from our presenter that doesn't quite sit right with you, um, we always ask that our, um, our dialogue between one another is productive. Um, and it's not just us screaming at each other and um, that we can actually um, produce a helpful uh, conversation. Um, so what I'm gonna ask is that, uh, just take a few volunteers to read over these really quickly, um, just so they can sit with you and so you guys can understand these a little bit better. Um, do we have a volunteer that can read the first one for us? Sweet, thanks. Thank you. 
What about the next one? Thank you. And what about number three? Go ahead. Thank you. And what about number four? And number five. Great. And is there anyone who would want to read the last one for us? Thank you. Um, so yeah, I just want you guys to think over those as we head into our discussion tonight um, and kind of abide by these guidelines. Um, if there's anything that um, you don't agree with or you have questions about. Um, so thank you guys for helping us get started with those. Um, so uh, we also have this uh, poem on your guys' tables. Do we see that? Yes, so this poem uh, is by Langston Hughes, um, and it's really a guiding force that we've used um, in framing our discussions for this series, in um, framing how we would love y'all to think about uh, what we're talking about. Um, so if it's good with you guys, I'm just gonna pass the mic around and we're all going to read a stanza. And if you don't want to read, you obviously don't have to, just pass it to the next person. Um, but when we're reading this poem, feel free to uh, mark it up, um, make notes of what's interesting, of things you have questions on, um, really be thinking about what this poem means um, as we go into our discussion tonight. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be the great, strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme, that any man be crushed by one above. Oh, let my land be, la be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There has never been equality for me nor freedom <clears throat> in this homeland of the free. So who are you that mumbles in the dark and who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same stupid plan of dog eat dog and mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of the strength, full of strength and hope tangled in the agent endless chain of profit, power, gain of, gain of grab the land. 
of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soul. I am the worker, sold to the machine. I am the Negro, servant to you all. I am the people, hum humble, hungry, mean. Hungry yet today, despite the dream. Beaten yet today, O oh pioneers. I am the man who never got ahead. The poorest worker bartered through the years. Yet I'm the one who dreamt our basic dream in the old world while still a surf of kings who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrow turned that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. For I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore in Poland's plain, in England's grassy lee, and torn from black Africa's strand, I come to build a homeland of the free. The free who said the free, not me, surely not me. The millions on relief today, the millions shot down when we strike, the millions who have nothing for our pay. For all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, and yet must be the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me an ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on people's lives, we must take back our land again, America. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rack and the ruin of our gangster death, the rape and the rot of the graft and the stealth and the lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plant, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. All right, thank you guys. Um, so I just want you guys to think about what that poem means, um, what it might have meant uh, when it was written, what Langston Hughes was thinking, and what it, what it means to you. Um, and I want you guys to think about that for a couple moments, um, and then chat with your table for probably about three or four minutes um, about what you guys found interesting in the poem um, and how that relates to this idea of the American dream. And um, if anyone has, a piece of paper at your table. Um, just jot down one or two things that you guys already know about the history of the American dream. Um, and then jot down one or two questions that you still have. What are some questions that you want answered tonight? Um, and we'll share some things that we already know to hopefully help guide our conversation tonight. Um, and then save those questions um, for the end. And if they're not answered, then we will have some time for Q&A. Um, so go ahead and talk with your table for about, probably about five-ish minutes, and we'll come back as a group.
We're going to take about two more minutes. Um, so if you haven't um, already, move on to asking um, what kinds of questions you have about the American dream that you'd like to see answered tonight. All right, let's bring it back together as a group. What are some of the things you guys talked about that you um, already know about the American dream or that you found interesting in the poem?
Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so based on the time period that it was written in, uh, Langston Hughes provides a multitude of perspectives in the poem. Yeah, that's really interesting. What are some other things? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so how this was written um, many, many years ago and still, uh, we're still facing a lot of the same issues today. What are some other things that you guys talked about that um, maybe you're coming into this? Is anyone coming into this with any knowledge of the American dream? Or are we all, yeah? Well, we can learn more about it. So could you, what was it called? The Four Myths. So Four Myths Regarding the American Dream. Um, so yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, our myths regarding the American Dream. Um, is there one other thing that anyone either knew or really liked about the poem that we read? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so this idea in the poem, this theme that um, the America that what he was told about um, isn't the reality, and yet um, he wants he wants to work on it, and he wants everyone reading that poem to work towards a better America. I think that's a really good takeaway from the poem. So, um, so thank you guys for running through that little activity with me. Um, I, I do this because I want you guys to start thinking about um, this idea of the American dream um, and what it is and what it isn't. Um, and with that, I will introduce our presenter for tonight. Um, Steve Tripp is a history professor here at Grand Valley, um, and he's going to be ta taking us through the history of the American dream um, and all of the um, myths and um, knowledge about that so yeah thank you yeah thank you uh, for being here and I'll hand off the mic now thank you is there a remote for this image I have one My name is Steve Tripp. I've been here for at Grand Valley for, I think next year will be my 30th year, which makes me really old. I'm going to try to move around as much as possible uh, for two reasons. One, uh, I'm really deaf, um, and so if I want to hear you, I'll probably need to like get in your face a little bit so I'm, to hear you better. And, and second, my son gave me a Fitbit, so I have to work on my step shield at home. Um, and probably the second reason, just as important as the first one. All right. Um, in, in thinking about this, when uh, I was first kind of approached about this, I thought, um, in, in looking at what uh, they had planned and everything else, I thought, well, the one thing that I could provide here is some sense of historical context. And I think what's important, a couple, couple, couple uh, uh, points that I want, take home points that I want you to have. Uh, one is that the American dream is a historical concept, which means that it has changed over time. Uh, it also means that there's a great deal of human agency in that, uh, that a 
Americans have changed with the green boomed over time. Or perhaps what I should say is that some Americans have defined what the green means over time. And that latter point, I think, will become more important uh, as we go on. In yes. Oh, up here, sorry. I'm not used to speaking with these things. I feel like I'm either giving an infomercial or giving a TED talk. Could you understand the first part, what I said there? Okay, am I all right right here? Now I feel like I want to be a lounge singer. Um, what's that? Ah. All right. So to begin with the American dream, this is where you'll notice in the Langston Hughes poem, um, there's a lot of talk about farmers in there, right? Langston Hughes wrote this, I'm not too sure of the exact date in which he wrote this, uh, but he was active from about the 1930s on, which means that he was writing primarily in an urban world. And yet, when he talks about the American dream, he talks about it within the context of kind of an agricultural society. That may seem rather odd, right? Um, in fact, that's because it, when uh, Americans first began to reflect upon the American dream, uh, they did so in an agricultural world. And they did so largely informed by kind of bucolic images like this. This is a uh, painting by a uh, fellow by the name of Edward Hicks. Um, it's not a particularly great painting, um, uh, but uh, it reflects the kind of bucolic agrarian view that Americans had at that time. Whoops. All right. I promise I'm not going to give you a lot of text here, um, but this is one pretty basic one. This is Thomas Jefferson. In 1787, <coughs> he was asked to write a book uh, by a French nobleman who said, gosh, America is an interesting place. You've got a republic. What's that like? What's it like to live there? And Thomas Jefferson, being kind of a uh, uh, philosophical type, uh, decided to write a book explaining what America was like. And this is one of the more uh, famous passages from it. And I don't think I'll get through reading all of it, but um, we'll read at least the first part, and maybe I'll, I'll flip around after that. Those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God, if ever he had a chosen people, whose breasts he has made his peculiar deposit for substantial and genuine virtue. It is the focus in which he keeps alive that sacred fire, which otherwise might escape from the face of the earth. Corruptions of moral in the mass of cultivators is a phenomenon of which no age nor nation has furnished an example. It is the mark set on those who do, do not looking up to heaven to their own soil and to be toil in industry, as does the husbandman for their subsistence, depend for it on the casualties and caprice of customers. Dependence begets subservience and banality, suffocates the germ of virtue, virtue and prepares fit toils for the designs of ambition. We'll stop there. A couple points. Obviously, Jefferson thinks that it's really important to work on a farm, right? Why? What's so great about farming? What's so great about farming? Yeah. It's your land, so why is that important to have your land? My land, this land is, oh, sorry. Ownership? Why would you, ownership of what? Of land? Ownership of what else? Yeah, yeah, it's sort of ownership of yourself, right? If you have your own land, then you're beholden to no one, right? Um, and that was very important to Jefferson. It was very important to other um, early Republicans, small r Republicans. Essentially what they believed is that uh, if you were independent, then no, uh, economically, then you were also independent politically. No one could tell you what to do. No one could force you to act in a certain way or to vote in a certain way. 
the land is important for that. Why else is land important? And think about what he says here. Corruption of the morals and the mass of cultivators, in other words, far farmers, is a phenomenon of which no age nor nation has furnished an example. In other words, farmers are really moral people. When I first started teaching at Grand Valley, uh, in any one class, I would have probably two or three farmers. That was just 30 years ago. So if I read this 30 years ago when I first started teaching here, I'd have at least two or three students who would be shaking their head up and down saying, yeah, damn right, that's what life is all about. Why would people think that being a farmer is more virtuous than what he's talking about having to drum up trade or things like that? that makes sense? What would be so virtuous about farming? Do any of you know any farmers? No one knows any farmers? Really? You do? Easy, you live on a farm? There you go, do you believe this? Is it easy life being a farmer? No, it's really hard. And so partly, right, you, and you're sort of explaining it, right? Uh, one, you have this process where you're, you're nurturing something over a long period of time, right? So all the sweat and sacrifice for that, right? So in fact, you're, other, you're sort of other-oriented in that, right? You're not thinking me, me, me. You're thinking crop, 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 right? Or pick, 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 what do you farm? Crops, OK. <laughs> cow, 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 whatever, right? The other thing is, right, because you're working so hard, that in and of itself, according to Jefferson, is a virtue. If you work, then that keeps you kind of, right, your nose to the grindstone, is that how it goes, nose to the grindstone, right? You don't have time for idleness. You don't have time to, to fantasize about crazy, weird things. You don't have time to get into trouble. You're working. And to Jefferson and to other Republicans, again, that was really, really important. And essentially what they said is that this is the virtue of America. Everyone can farm. Everyone has land. And thus, everyone will be independent and virtuous as a result of that. And large numbers of people, right, bought into that. They bought into that because America seemed to be endless in its land. And they made a virtue, just as we saw Langston Hughes do, they made a virtue here of the farmer. And notice here he is, the yeoman. Have you ever heard that phrase, yeoman? Yeoman is another name for a farmer. And uh, Look at all the things our yeoman is doing, right? He's working hard, but he also has a family. This is supposed to be, I think, like either a social church event. Down here it says what? Faith, hope, charity, fidelity. That's good farming, right? Venerate the plow, meaning praise the plow. And if you couldn't be a farmer, you could be the next best thing. You could be an artisan. This is a fairly famous painting from the early 19th century called by John Nagel. It's called Pat Lyon at the Forge. Tell me about Pat Lyon just based upon that painting. What kind of man is Pat Lyon? You're my favorite student because you always have something to say. Thank you. Man's man, Pat Lyon. Rawr. Yeah, it's actually his real name, so you know it's not like he made it up. Yeah. Does he look like a man's man? What is he doing? Tools. Yeah. He's got. Can I darken this slightly? I don't want to have you guys in the dark. It's the light system that allows me to do that.
This will be really nice. I'll have the microphone. We'll have darker, slightly darker. That's probably too dark. Because now I'm really going to feel like lounge singing. Notice here he's got a he's got a big anvil. There we go. Anvil. He's got his hammer. He's a blacksmith, right? And by 1827 terms, we would call a John Gums, right? That's a pretty strong looking guy. And he looks, right, very proud of what he does. Even though he's hot and tired, sweaty, right? Being a blacksmith is probably one of the least enjoyable jobs in the world. He's a proud man. He's a, a friend of mine in grad school would say he's a square-jawed American, right? Looking straight at us, very proud. Why? For the same reasons that Jefferson venerates the plow. You can also venerate the blacksmith here he's strong and independent. This is Abraham Lincoln who comes from that same tradition. And in 1860 when he ran for president, this is what he said. Again, based upon this notion that the opportunities for land ownership were endless. When one starts out poor as most do in the race of life, free society is such that he knows he can better his condition. He knows that there is no fixed condition of labor for his whole life. I am not ashamed to confess that 25 years ago I was a hired laborer, mauling rails at work on a flat boat. Do you guys know what mauling rails means? It means like cutting wood, essentially. Right. He was called the rail splitter. So he's making rails. And then they use that to drive the, uh, the river boats. I was a hired mauling rails at work on a flat boat. Just what might happen to any poor's man's, poor man's son. That is the true system. So notice he's added something here, right? It isn't just land ownership he's saying. There's a sense here of a kind of social and economic mobility that he started out a poor man's son and yet by his own labors, right? He succeeded, raised himself a little bit higher. And I'll, I'll ask this question of you. How many of you uh, expect that you will do better than your parents, than those who raised you? How many of you expect that you will do better than those who raised you? Maybe? Oh, no, good. Um, it's interesting, when I, I've asked this question of students probably every year for at least the last 20 years, and generally speaking, you guys are way too modest, about 90% of students at least will raise their hand and say yes. And that, in fact, is part of our tradition of the American dream. It isn't just that we will achieve something. Part of the American dream is the expectation that we will do slightly better at least than our parents. And in fact, if you talk to your parents or you, you talk to whoever raised you, chances are that is their expectation for you as well. They want you to be incrementally, be at least, better than they were. That's you know, why they uh, want you to go to college. That's why they're encouraging you to go to you know, college, maybe even grad school, all of those sorts of things. And this is embedded in the 19th century when, in fact, a person could, again, at least the expectation was that you could own land and be independent. And Lincoln set himself up as kind of that example. But there's a big but to this. And this is where that other part of the American dream is that it doesn't always hold for everybody. And you'll notice in Langston Hughes, right, he says, wow, let America be America again. There's sort of two things there that Langston Hughes is suggesting. One is that America was once America, right? There once was a time when this dream, these promises were real. But 
he also says they were never real for me, and they were never real for people like me, African Americans. This is uh, George Washington, a painting of George Washington by Junius Brutus Stearns, and it's got a rather interesting, almost ironic title, Washington is a farmer at Mount Vernon. You'll notice he's not the one farming, right? His slaves are farming. The enslaved are farming. And those must be his children. They're not farming either. And in fact, almost from the inception of America, to be African American was the antithesis of whiteness. And they were portrayed as the antithesis of whiteness. Whereas a white American is portrayed here, as you see here with the yeoman farmer, sturdy, upright, strong, secure, independent, knowing. The African American is portrayed as the opposite, the antithesis. And this is a rather telling image. This is the original Jim Crow. This is uh, actually from a piece of sheet music, in which we get the term Jim Crow. Um, a very racist song, obviously a very racist image. Not sturdy, not strong, not independent, not rugged, right? Loose limbed, often portrayed as a kind of almost perpetual child. Why? Because he doesn't have those things. All those things that Jefferson was talking about, by the way, if I go back to this, Jefferson was also saying at the same time that African Americans were not African Americans, they weren't American. They were a race apart, they were even what he would call a breed apart. In this same book, Notes on the State of Virginia, Jefferson uh, compares African Americans not to whites, but to gorillas and monkeys and things of that sort. Extremely racist piece. Emancipation, when African Americans gained their freedom after the Civil War, and as a result of the Civil War, that might have been a turning point in which they became part of the American dream. And this is a uh, illustration by Thomas Nast. You may not know the name Thomas Nast, but I bet you know at least one of his images that he created. He was a, uh, a uh, newspaper political cartoonist in the mid-19th century. And Santa Claus, fat, jolly little guy, our image of Santa Claus was created by Thomas Nast. And uh, here he's being far more political, and he's saying, and not this man, meaning why isn't the African American part of the American dream, essentially? Why isn't he part of the American Republic? That's Lady Liberty saying, he sacrificed for the war, he is a man, why isn't he counted? In 1935, um, African-American sociologist and historian uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, is that a name you guys know? You guys know who Du Bois is? Uh, first African-American to gain a PhD from Harvard University, which he did, I think, in 1906. And he actually gained it in two fields, sociology and history. A brilliant, brilliant person. 1935, he wrote a seminal history of Reconstruction. Um, and this is one of my favorite passages in, in, of all historians. He said, the most magnificent drama in the last thousand years of human history is the transportation of 10 million human beings out of the dark beauty of their mother continent into the newfound El Dorado of the West, meaning the African slave trade, right? From Africa to Americas. They descended into hell, and in the third century, they rose from the dead. In the finest effort to achieve democracy for the working millions which this world has ever seen, it was a tragedy that beggared the Greek. It was an upheaval of humanity like the Reformation and the French Revolution. Yet we are blind and led by the blind. We discern it no part of our labor movement, no part of our industrial triumph, no part of our religious experience before the dumb eyes of 10 generations of 10 million children. In other words, the generations of all those Africans 
uh, who originally came over, their descendants. It is made mockery of and spit upon, a degradation of the eternal mother, a sneer at human effort, with aspiration and art deliberately and elaborately distorted. That distortion is images like the Jim Crow image that I just showed you. And why? Because in a day when the human mind aspired to a science of human action, a history and psychology of the mighty effort of the mightiest century, we fell under the leadership of those who would compromise with truth in the past in order to make peace in the present and guide policy in the future. In other words, we fell victim to racism. And so this moment of emancipation, this is uh, another image by Thomas Nast, ended in racism. And even Nast himself fell victim to that racism. Notice he is creating here, by the middle of the 1870s, racist images of African Americans. Meanwhile, Victorians began to redefine the Jeffersonian creed for the new urban realities. As America changed, the American dream changed. This is one of my favorite images, as you well know. I showed this to you, right? This is uh, what's called a lithograph. A lithograph just means it's a painted image. Uh, they became very, very popular in the mid-19th century, so middle-class people could have art on their walls. Just like today, right, when you, gra uh, when you graduated, when you uh, moved into your dorms or whatever here at the Big U, uh, you probably bought some posters, right, and put them up on your wall. Well, if this was 1877, you'd get a courier and eyes lithograph. Can you guys see this well enough? Tell me what's going on here in this image. Use your interpretive powers for me. Yeah, you can, can, you can see what the latter is saying, right? Yeah, so what are those apples? That's the fruit, right? If you work hard, you ascend the ladder and you can have these fruit. And it's an interesting list. Tell me what you think here. Influence, contentment, honor, a good conscience, the favor of God, good life, riches. I can't read that well. Goodwill to men, success. I wish I could read that. That's funny. Self respect. In other words, what this image is saying is what? What are the fruits of which we aspire in our quest for the American dream? Is it all about the money? Is it? Is it all about money? What is it about then? Okay, so what are those fruit? If it's not money, I mean, riches are there, right? So it's not that money isn't, is not important, it's just that it's complemented by other things, right? So what are some of those other things? Yeah, how can you categorize those? How would you categorize those things? Hmm? Self-respect, contentment, the favor of God. Privilege. I'm sorry? Privilege. Privilege? How do you mean? Like, like status or something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think there's some of that, right? Being well regarded by others, right? It isn't the sort of privilege that's egotistical, though, right? It's, it's just, you know, being respected for doing a good job in life. Yeah. Someone had their hand up there? I'm sorry? Ooh, I like that. What does that mean exactly? Okay, yeah, yeah. 
a, a sense of your own self-worth, right? That you did good and you know you did the right thing. It's a very interesting, I think, sense of, of the American dream, right? What else do you see going on here? It's a really interesting image. And you have to agree with me because I have the microphone. What else do you see? What's in the background? Can you see that? Yeah. Is that the right way to get the American dream? That's all financial, right? Lottery policy, which is like the lottery. Strikes, betting, the stock exchange. We'll talk about the stock exchange in a minute. Those are all financial. What's wrong with that? How many of you ever, like, gamble? You know, I don't want you know, give away your sins. We won't go that far. But um, you know, you play like a scratch-off lottery game, something like that, or you have a friendly game of poker with your friends. Uh, you bet on March Madness. Any of you betting on the Super Bowl? What's wrong with that? Well, obviously, you don't think anything's wrong with it, but according to this, you'd be going to hell, just so you know. What's wrong with those things? As they would see it. Are you working for those things when you're doing them? No. Remember what Jefferson said, right? Work is equated with virtue. These things are cheap ways of trying to get wealth. Much better to climb the ladder, right? And by climbing the ladder, you gain these virtues, you show those virtues, and then you get the reward. To do any other way is cheating. And notice all these nice, sturdy artisans, right? By the way, it's fun to play the game of who are these people that are climbing? You guys know what this guy is? It's called a carpenter's rule or square. So he's a carpenter. What's this guy? This is the fun one. He's got this hook thing. It's a scythe, possibly, which means he would be a farmer. It could be a grappling hook, right? So he could be what was called a huckster, uh, uh, which is a person who hauled things. Or my personal favorite, he's a mass murderer. It's possible? No, I don't think so. All right, what else do you see here? So those are the kind of people who can go up, right? Even people in a top hat, right? He's some sort of businessman. He's got his ledger there. What about, what else do you see? What's on the other side of the ladder? Hmm? A child? There's actually three children, right? There's this guy, right? There's this little boy. That's actually a boy. He's wearing pantaloons. And there's the daughter, right? All right. I'll ask it this way. In this room, who would be allowed to go up the ladder? Who would not be allowed to go up the ladder? Most of you would probably not be allowed to go up the ladder. Why? Yeah, yeah. Men can go up the ladder, women can't. And that's really clear by the image, right? Here's dad pontificating. Son, go up the ladder, right? He's actually, you know, telling this little tyke to go up. This boy, he's already, right? He's got his school books there, but he's like, I'm a man now. I'm going up the ladder. But what's mo <laughs> This guy's really creepy. This is like the uncle that lives with you and you, right? He's never had a job, and you're like, what are you doing here, uncle? <laughs> All right, anyway. What's she doing? There's almost a sense in which she's holding her daughter back, right? And they're looking down. They're not looking up. 
This is a man's world. Did you notice that, by the way, in Langston Hughes' poem? Did any of you talk about that? It's a masculine vision. There's no talk of women. All the pronouns, I think, are he. There's no feminine pronouns in that. So that leaves the question of what happens to women. And the Victorians in the mid-19th century have an answer to that. They called it the domestic ideal. Now, this is supposed to be interactive, so here's the one really interactive thing that we're going to be doing besides me talking to you. And that is, I want you to pose yourself like, this is, uh, the name of this image, by the way, is the, um, do you remember what it's called? failed my exam. Um, it's called the light of the home. Light of the home. That's what it's called. Um, so I want you to try to pose like the light of the home. And this is uh, both men and women. You have to really try to get this. The light of the home. So yeah, yeah. I want you to, I want you to take the posture. This is really fun for me because I get to laugh at you. No, kidding. Um, it's really difficult. Try to position yourself as that woman is positioning herself. You, yeah, you need a bit. But really, the cru crucial part is the neck and the face. Here, I'll get out of the way so you can. You're not even trying. You've got to sit up straight. And then, right? You have to tilt your head. Is that a natural tilt to do that? I told you I've been teaching here for almost 30 years, and I've shown this image at least once a semester, probably most of those years. And over the years, trying to do that, I've actually had to have two uh, cervical fusions because it's so difficult to make that. I've had two cervical fusions. That's not why, but that's my joke. I think that's pretty funny. Anyway, um, why is the artist pre 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 presenting her in that weird pose? What is he trying to convey? Who's, oh, I'm sorry, here. How does it look more feminine? Yeah. 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 So what is what is that what makes that more feminine? Okay, okay. So rather than being kind of independent, it's submissive, right? Yeah. What else? That's perfect. What else? It's actually conveying a couple different aspects of what it meant to be a woman in the mid-19th century. Yeah. She, yeah, yeah, she's safely planted, right, at home. So she's domestic, right? And is she happy? She actually looks like she's taken about five Valium or something like that. So she's kind of dopey looking. But I think that's supposed to be contentment, right? She is satisfied. This is her world. This is, you know, all that matters to her is, is right there. Even though there, I think there's a little cat someplace. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's more of the submissiveness, right? Yeah. By the way, doesn't the boy look kind of mischievous? I think the mother's just worn out because that kid is such a little brat. No, anyway. Um, <coughs> there's something else that's going. Remember I told you the title of this is The Light of the Home. By posturing, right, there's a sense of submissiveness, right? But by tilting the head, God's light shines upon her. And if the lighting in this room was better, you would see that. God's light shines upon her and then emanates to every other member of the family. 
She is the light of the home. She is both pure and more pious. A historian in the 1960s said this is essentially a, a cult of domesticity, a cult of true womanhood. She said the four aspects of this are, see, you remember this part, oh yeah, I asked you for the title, but no, um, are submissiveness, domesticity, piety, and purity. For women in the 19th century, that was their dream. That was their expectation of what would give them fulfillment. And you can see that here. This is more courier and knives. And notice this is called stages of a man's life from cradle to the grave. And then stages of a woman's life from cradle to the grave. And notice all the things that men get to do. They can become businessmen. I don't know what this guy is, a sailor maybe, right? A soldier, a business, right? Wealth, look at that. He's got a frock coat. That's a symbol of prosperity. Women, oh, you get to be a baby. Then you get to get play with baby dolls. And then you get married. Then you have a baby. And that's the end of it. Great life, huh? You wonder if um, uh, a woman wrote the Langston Hume's poem, how she would describe that, right? Meanwhile, more meanwhile, what about Native Americans? This is an, another famous painting. It's called American Progress, also from the Victorian era. Who's that woman floating above everyone else? It's Lady Liberty, right? You're leaving me? Oh, really? Have fun. Lady Liberty, right? And she's carrying forth, right, carrying onward, and taking Americans with them, right? Notice that much of what uh, Langston Hughes, to go back to Langston Hughes' poem, he talks about this, right? The pioneers moving forward, having land, having this dream. And the painting is describing that as progress. Unfortunately, you can barely see it, and I'm sorry for the lighting. Right here are Native Americans. And they're sort of stumbling along the way, running from Lady Liberty here, uh, almost looking rather terrified. They're, they're bare-chested to emphasize that they are not the civilized people that are coming forward. This land isn't their land, right? There's more Native Americans in the background. The buffalo are running too, implying almost that Native Americans and the buffalo are almost of the same genre somehow. And this, for all intents and purposes, is the end of Native Americans on the plains. This was the Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890. Close to 300 indigenous men, women, and children were killed on the last what was called major military action of the Plains War. The ground was so frozen um, at the time of the massacre that they just left the dead out there until the, land, uh, until the ground was good enough to, or, or dry enough, warm enough to thaw, and then they just dumped them in this uh, mass grave. All right, moving into the 20th, oh, wait, shoot. This is, this is all for effect. Are you ready? I mean, I know you already saw it, but you really have to like be really impressed with this because this is my technology as best good as it gets. Huh? I want you to notice the phallic nature of this. 
I show these images in, in one of the classes, or a couple of classes I teach. I do a lot with advertising. And uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, there's this constant uh, motif in advertising of women uh, getting, uh, what's the word? Uh, of, of using appliances as phallic symbols and women kind of uh, relishing these phallic symbols. Uh, this one has men and women, but many of them just have women. Uh, um, and some of them are, are like downright erotic. It's weird. How did we get here to this point which material possessions largely define our self-worth? But um, the art of better living. This becomes the dream in the 1950s. Remember what the Victorians believed, what the Jeffersonians believed. Now in post-war America, it's all about possessions. How did we get here? Well, large part we got here through this guy, Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays should be uh, someone that we're talking about right now, and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, Edward Bernays was, th are any of you public relations majors or advertising? Anyone? Um, Edward Bernays is considered the father of public relations. Uh, his euphemism for propaganda. Uh, and he was the author of the book, Propaganda, in 1928. Much of what advertisers did for the next decades, probably to this day, is based upon the ideas of Edward Bernays. Bernays was also the nephew of Sigmund Freud. He started out actually as a psychologist, psychiatrist, then decided he could make more money in advertising, and thus he went. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in de democratic society. Those who man manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. In almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. What does that sound like? How many of you read the uh, Lanthorn article or heard about the infamous Lanthorn article? What's that about? Yeah, yeah, I think th I, the question was, right, who would you like to have dinner with? And he said, Adolf Hitler. Why did he say Adolf Hitler? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he said, I'm amazed how he got all these people to rally behind him, right? That's amazing. I don't want to talk about the, uh, 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 the bad things that he did. I'm aware of those, but... What amazes me is his ability to rally people the way that he did. What's the relationship here between Bernays and Hitler? Hitler read Bernays. The Nazis read Bernays. Bernays essentially was giving the Nazi party the framework, the blueprint. They loved Bernays. They thought Bernays was a genius. And the reason I bring this up and connect it to the Lanthorn, the really sad thing I think about this whole Lanthorn to do, and I hope that it, it uh, leads to better ends than it currently has, rather than just using this as a moment to condemn this poor guy for saying something that was really stupid, it should be a teachable moment, right? In which we talk about, okay, well, how does that happen? Why is that so appealing 
even in our society today. And much of this, again, goes back to Edward Bernays. To persuade people to act in ways that you think they should act, Bernays thought that was incumbent upon the intelligent people in America to do to the masses. Society is too complex, Bernays said. We can't allow people just to decide on their own. We have to give them leadership. We have to tell them what is good and what is bad. One way to say that is he was, what would they call him, what, an influencer, a tastemaker? That's more Bernays, I won't get into that one. So advertisers largely, in our day and age, from the 1920s on, have defined what the American dream is. <coughs> and notice how much different it is than the era of the Great Depression. And I mean, not the era of the Great Depression, the 1890s and 1870s and the Victorians. This is uh, Bruce Barton, who's probably the most uh, famous advertiser of the period. Um, in other words, he was probably making the most money, even more than Bernays. Consumers should discard the old-fashioned notion that the chief end of life is steadily growing savings account, and that one must eliminate all pleasures from the vigorous years for possible want in old ages. Life is meant to enjoy, and as you go along, if self-denial is necessary, I'll practice some of that when I'm old and not try to do it all now. For who knows, I may never be old. In other words, live now, right? By the way, this is a fun ad. Just notice it's teaching envy, right? You and I enter this ad as this woman, right? And we're looking at this scene this opulent woman dressed in a silk pajamas, her maid at her feet helping her. She's apparently, what, about to go into her green marble tub and have a bath, right? Oh, we want that life. Can we have it? Well, we can at least have the towels. That's Bernays for you. Here's conspicuous consumption, the basis in which good repute in any highly organized industrial community ultimately rests is pecuniary strength and the means of showing pecuniary strength and so of gaining or retaining a good name and leisure and a conspicuous consumption of goods. We buy, in other words, to give ourselves status. And here's an ad emphasizing that. Pretty substantial people, no doubt, in that new brick house. How many of you own a brick house? Any of you? live in a brick house? Do you? Wow. That's substantial. I don't. I've just got poor aluminum siding. <laughs> Advertising defined the dream, but also the nightmares. And ad this is a big point of advertising in the 1920s, to emphasize the social costs if you don't buy their products. This one, often a bridesmaid, but never a bride. Oh, remember the domestic ideal that I showed you earlier. But what if no one wants to marry you because you have bad breath? How many of you have heard that phrase, always the bridesmaid, never the bride? Right. That's from this ad from the 1920s. This one's really good. Don't stare at me like that. Her own husband, who hadn't known for years whether a gown was worn for the first or 20th time, staring at her, a hard, appraising stare at that. What's the matter with your face, he asked in that kindly way of husbands. Her face is looking old. <sighs> she needs Heinz. And also for men. Gee, Pop, they're all passing you. Or what happens with the man doesn't, isn't as fresh as he might be. They don't talk so much about men not getting married. They do talk about them not getting ahead in business. So women still have this domestic ideal. Men at least have this kind of economic ideal that they're looking for. We feel the effects of all this as we try to define the American dream for ourselves. 
Success has become supersized. You guys recognize, this is like, a, I think this is pretty funny. It's supposed to be David, right? Like a fat David, sometimes called the American David. I wanted to get this as a, uh, a garden statue, and my wife wouldn't let it me. So I get to show it to you. Supersizing has become increasingly the American dream. This is the Coke that I bought when I was a kid. 6.5 ounces. What has happened? We've gone from the big gulp to the super big gulp to the double gulp to the extreme gulp. That's a lot of gulping. Is this the fifth third burger? Right? In other words, right, if you can supersize a drink, you can supersize a burger. Oh, you can supersize ice cream. I didn't know that one was in here. I thought I'd take it. That's me picking myself out on ice cream. You can supersize a car. Shopping. A house. These are all McMansions. By the way, notice, remember the, the uh, agrarian ideal of having your own farm and all that land and grass and lawn and all of that? Now the house takes up the entire property. You can supersize a dorm. This is the Holton Hooker. Is Holton Hooker Center still around at Grand Valley with dorms? Look at this. Two students living in one room. What's it turned into? I'm biting the hand that feeds me here. The dorm being replaced by the Living Center. Any of you live at Niemeyer Living Center or have lived in Niemeyer Living Center? It's an opulent life, right? Corian, in, is it Corian in the bathroom? Is that where it is? Is the kitchen counter Corian? No, th that's just linoleum. God, you guys suffer so much. This is my ancestral home. Do you want to see this or not? This is this was a pretty typical home, right? I grew up in Oakland, California. My parents bought this house in 1956, the year I was born, because I was coming. They were running out of room. Um, in the house that they rented. So they bought this house for $16,000. The only way they could afford it is because my grandmother uh, saw my mother crying because I was gonna be born. And she was crying, crying, crying. My grandmother said, why are you crying? And she said, I don't know how we can afford another child. We can't fit them all in you know, the house that we're renting. My grandmother said, oh, don't worry about it. I'll loan you some money so you can buy a house. So they bought this house very middle classy house in Oakland, California, $16,000. By the way, my parents were so poor that when they bought the house, my grandmother also said, move in at night so no one sees your furniture. And that, they remained really frugal. So what happened to that? This is, maybe I'll show you this. This is what happened to my house after my father sold it. They turned it into a McMansion. And he turned around and sold the $16,000 house for $2.5 million. Is that sickening? That's why I live in Grand Rapids. Because who can afford to live in Oakland, California? All right. There's a real mansion for you, right? Oprah. For the rich, circa 1990. For the rich now, so we're getting bigger in our supersizing, right? 
This is the Gulfstream 700, the largest, most expensive private jet in the world. Cost, that should be 75 million, obviously. Betsy DeVos family owns 12 private jets, one Boeing business jet, five Gulfstream G550s, one Gulfstream G450, two Bombardier Challenger 350s, three Cessna Citation CJ4s. Family also owns four helicopters and 10 yachts. All their yachts are registered in the Cayman Islands to avoid taxes. That's the American dream, right? Realized. You can supersize your body, right? Arnold, you know what that is? Breast implants. You can supersize breasts, and you can have supersized egos. Ta-da! What does it all mean? One, inequality and exclusion have been basic features of the American dream from the nation's outset. But at least the American dream was once connected to and helped bolster basic notions of Repu American republicanism, right? That was Jeffersonian's dream. American dream once encapsulated values of character and altruism, altruism as much as material reward. That was true all the way through the Victorians. Materialism has become the centerpiece of the dream, at least in much of our popular culture. We accept gross inequalities, inequalities that run counter to our basic values of fairness and justice for the sake of the dream. That's going back to all of this, right? Oh. As such, the pursuit of the dream may actually harm the republic. And as I asked, maybe it's time to reformulate the dream. And that's it. I wasn't sure I'd get done in the hour allotted me, but I did. Thank you very much. I hope it wasn't too much imagery there for you. Too fast a pace. Any questions? Any questions? If you are at a table now um, where you're not sitting with anyone, maybe move um, and just chat with your neighbor about um, what you saw and what you learned today. Um, and write down any other questions that you may have. So when we're thinking about um, those questions that you guys had at the beginning, think about did those questions get answered? Um, and what did you learn? Um, and then if you have any other questions, write those down as well. Um, we'll chat with your tables for about five or so minutes, uh, and then we'll come back as a group, and you can ask those questions then. All right, thanks.
All right, let's come back together really quickly um, and just first, uh, what did you guys talk about at your tables? Like what did you learn from this or what did you find interesting? Um, I was walking around, I heard some pretty interesting conversations. So I'd love for you guys to share those things with our, with our group here tonight. Can I? ask you to share what you guys were talking about. Yeah, so this idea of the American dream um, you know, based on where you come from or where you're at now, um, your economic status, all of that stuff plays into how you see the American dream. I thought that was very interesting. Um, what are some other things that you guys were talking about at your tables that you either learned from this presentation or that you found interesting? Um, and we can open it up to any questions you guys still have as well.
yeah, so this idea of the American dream uh, in the 50s and 60s being more concrete, is that what you guys were kind of getting at? And now there's so much, so many different ideas floating around that it's almost like everyone has a different idea of what the American dream is. I like that. Is there anything else that anyone would like to say or any questions that we still have for our presenter before we wrap things up tonight? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I really like that, that this idea that you guys were talking about, about how the American dream is different for everyone is on some aspects a good thing because there's not this, um, this concrete idea of like what you have to be, but at the same time, yeah, it, it can cause conflict and confusion. Um, so there are definitely pros and cons, definitely. And anything else before we wrap it up? All right, well, let's give a round of applause to our presenter tonight. He did a great job. Thank you. Uh, and the last thing I'll ask you guys is just those evals on the table, if you could fill those out before you leave. Uh, we do Democracy 101s every week, six to eight, most of the time in this room. So if you uh, liked this, um, come check it out again. But thank you guys for coming. Have a great night.